Next, uh, again, will be uh, Carlos Bashara, uh, coming from the University of uh, Loyola in Chicago, uh, talking about uh, traumatic aortic injuries. Thanks. All right. My favorite topic, trauma. So we do some trauma. We didn't do trauma when I was here at Methodist, which was in a way nice, honestly, but now we do a fair number of trauma uh, in Chicago. So I'm gonna mainly focus on the thoracic part, uh, blunt thoracic trauma. Actually, a lot of the data literature actually came from across the street from Herman Memorial, Dr. Azizadeh, who actually now moved to California. So, um, so blunt aortic uh, injury is the second cause of death in the blunt chest injuries. Uh, you know, no surprise, the majority of those are from MVCs, uh, high-speed impacts, and deceleration injuries. Um, so basically, you have a shear force from a deceleration at like fixed points. 60% um, of the injuries that we see are distal to, distal to the left subclavian. Um, and then the other ones are shared kind of with the ascending uh, arch and the descending. Now, penetrating injuries is interesting because if you have uh, stab wounds, a lot of times, you know, you kind of reach to the, to the high. So usually there's like an upper thorax, you see a lot of uh, uh, ascending. And then if it's a gunshot wound or something, usually we see it in the descending for the penetrating injuries. Now, for the abdominal part, which I added a few abdominal parts, because last, uh, last year they only focused on the thoracic, so, um, so usually you see it when you have um, uh, like um, uh, fractures in the thoracolumbar spine and seat belt injuries, that's when you see it. Now, for the penetrating, uh, uh, you see some abdominal injuries, but usually the IVC is the number one. I know it's not sometimes will come on your uh, V-site exam, but IVC is the number one. And I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the zones, uh, but we'll show you a slide later with the zones in the abdomen. So it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, so this is 2010 from the uh, National uh, uh, Vital Statistics Report. Uh, there was 38,000 uh, uh, motor vehicle death. Um, 12,500 were from uh, you know, uh, blunt aortic injuries. So that's more than what we see for, from dissection and aneurysm. So it's a, it's a problem. You know, and then again, it's all about basically fixed points and acceleration, deceleration injury um, in these cases. You know, the majority, like we said, they're distal to the isthmus, uh, left subclavian. Oof, that's not projecting. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's projecting good here. So, so this is kind of your algorithm. Now it's pretty much all these like major trauma centers. They even have a CAT scan in the ER. Uh, you know, we, we used to do, you know, drive, um, drive by chest x -ray. Now there's a drive by CAT scan. You can get it. One thing I also added to the, uh, to the algorithm, a lot of times when you do fast, also you look at the pericardium if you suspect you know, tamponade or something. So. Uh, but that's, it seems like everyone these days gets the cast on. So you can see the injuries are pretty obvious. You have a pseudoaneurysm uh, in both pictures. And uh, this is an awardogram again showing uh, pseudoaneurysm distal to the left subclavian, which is, uh, like I said, the most common injury. So again, IVIS um, you know, has been used in some of these cases, and actually in some cases it could be better than a CAT scan. So we all know, you know the nice thing about it is you know, no radiation, no contrast, you can size see. Uh, the graph that you're going to use, uh, and also you can tell tells you more about what's happening, what kind of injury, and also tells you if there's like thrombus or calcium. So it's it's a good tool uh, if you if you want to use it. So like I said, this is a day across the street at Herman uh, Memorial. Uh, so they actually uh, introduced or, or or described the utility of IVIS. And really, they found if you have you know like um, uh, uh, you know kind of CAT scans, they're not 100%. Uh, uh, sure what's going on. Usually IVIS is uh, more sensitive than angiogram and can be very helpful. Now, so a uh, few things. I've personally never seen an aortic spindle, but there's a few uh, false uh, positive stuff that you could see. Uh, one of them is the aortic spindle. The other one is ductus uh, diverticulum. Uh, you, know, you can imagine you have someone with a high-speed impact. You see this, you're like, oh, I don't know, what is this? But, you know, just keep it in mind. Uh, and also you have a bronchial intercostal artery also that could show up as an, an angiogram, as a nub, too. Um, Again, across the street, they looked at their initial experience with endovascular repair, and I'll, sh I'll share some data with you guys. Um, but you know, total, total aortic blunt injury, I mean, those are, you know, have a spectrum of injuries, and I'll show you some pictures and stuff. And then also the, the, how the algorithm of treatment evolved over the years. So you can see this is, uh, uh, you can see a tear on the one on the right, and you can see intramural hematoma uh, from the next one. You know, just showing you the layers of the aortic wall. I'm all you're familiar with it. And again, this is the grading that we should we use, and you should all be familiar with it. Um, so grade one, there's no question about it. We have good data to support medical treatment. Obviously four, and there's no question you have to fix it. 
Um, most of us will fix three, two. You know, it's, uh, it all depends on the injury, but the guidelines which I'll show you actually the, do support treating two, three, and four, uh, but we don't have really very robust data about it. So, and it all depends on the injury. A lot of times when you see two and three, sometimes they have concomitant injuries, like a brain injury. You want to lower the pressure in your surgery, you want to raise, raise the pressure, so you end up treating it so they can raise the pressure for the brain injury. Um, or on the other hand, like there's a lady a few months ago, she had a you know, grade two very small hematoma. She, surprisingly, she didn't have many other injuries, just like a few broken ribs and stuff. So actually I watched her and she did fine. Um, and I knew she will, you know, some of these trauma patients, you know, sometimes they don't follow up, but she, you know, we, we had a discussion, she lives close by, so we've been doing follow up and she almost healed her, her injury. So you can individualize your cases too. So these are the pictures going from, Schematic pictures into IVIS, into angiogram, and uh, CAT scan uh, showing intimal tear, grade one. Uh, this is a grade two where you have a, a intramural hematoma. Uh, this is your three, Eps aneurysm, and obviously your four, you can see. So, the, so the, something to, to look for is that, is that, you know, you can see on the CAT scan, you don't see any effusion. So that's important. Now, if you look at the four, you already see some layering, some effusion on the right, on the left side of the chest. So, so um, you know, uh, but it's kind of obvious you have a big disruption. So grade one, like I said, a lot, uh, a lot of us will just uh, treat, you know, two, I usually individualize, but again, a lot of times we have to treat just because they wanna raise the blood pressure for intracranial injuries, and obviously for there's no question about it, you have to do open or endo. I added this slide because we don't really talk about uh, how to do it open, everything is done endo, but basically you wanna go in the fourth intercostal space, there's a few things you wanna do, obviously you wanna minimize your clamp, you wanna go clamp, and, you know, down and minimize, you know, spinal cord ischemia, so basically just don't limit your clamp between the left comacrod, the subclavian, and then just distal to the injury, so can minimize your uh, spinal ischemia time. And there's other adjuncts you can do. You can do a distal aortic perfusion or, or cardiopulmonary bypass, and I'll show you some data also on that. Um, so, um, so society of vascular surgery have a, a clinical practice guidelines. Uh, so basically, this is the uh, authors uh, that they uh, basically reviewed. 139 studies um, and uh, basically looked at the mortality. The majority of those injuries were males. So for TVAR was 9%, for the operative repair was 19%, and non-operative was 46%, statistically significant to both open and, and endo. Uh, now spinal cord injury was obviously not surprising uh, at all. That was much lower for the TVAR, and then also the uh, end-stage renal disease also was much, uh, much lower for the, uh, for the TVAR patients. So basically, what they, the uh, you know, clinical practice guidelines suggest that obviously we should treat you know, uh, two, three, and, and four, obviously, and we should also treat them with endo if we can. Uh, again, this is a case of grade one, and then you can see a post-op, it's gonna, it starts to heal. Like I said, I had a similar case with a, with a grade two, and also she healed it without any problems. But you have to do close follow-up also for these patients. Um, and obviously, for grade four, you just wanna take them and treat them uh, urgently. Uh, again, this is a case where the embolize eventually went back to, uh, and embolized the left subclavian to contain that leak and did the TVAR. So someone asked, uh, actually real quick, someone asked yesterday uh, about uh, doing TVAR for the, some of these young patients. So, so what I usually do, so the patient I treated was like, I think was 30 or 35. So I made sure that I talked to him. I talked to the parents about, I have no idea what's going to happen to him when he's 50. So it's very important that you document in your chart that you had that discussion and they need to have follow up. I usually initially do CAT scans, but then to minimize uh, CAT scan radiation, I just do x-rays, and then I do blood pressure in the arms and legs, because sometimes these could present with pseudocoarctation. There's my, the stent might collapse, and they have pseudocoarctation. So you wanna make sure that you document, uh, that you talk to them about it, and you know, uh, and if there's any issues, then they can have an elective open repair. Uh, if there's any issues with it. So the, the uh, evolution of treatment changed. Like I said, there, there was a distal aortic perfusion, uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, and now you know, recently we've been doing more and more TVAR. So uh, again, uh, they looked at some, uh, some of these data over time. Uh, you can see the majority of those recently have been done with uh, TVAR. But basically what that study showed is that over time there was like close to 2% reduction in mortality per year as we moved along and using TVAR. Uh, so just again, basically all these now are treated with TVAR, especially if there's anatomically suitable. Uh, again, the majority of these injuries were from motor vehicle accidents. Let me just go through quickly. Uh, and then this is how we repaired the majority of them, like I said, were TVAR. They used some distal aortic perfusion. They, said they did also some cardiopulmonary bypass um, and just um, oh, uh, clamp and sew techniques. Um, and then when they looked at it, basically TVAR um, had the lowest paraplegia and stroke and uh, mortality uh, was actually comparable to the distal aortic perfusion at 5% 
Um, and again, this is a slide showing that the reduction per year, uh, moving from this aortic perfusion to delayed repair, and then how TVAR basically had the lowest mortality. It was like 2% per year, and it was statistically significant. And obviously, it's survivor, so red line is a TVAR. So initially, you had the benefit for uh, survival. Eventually, the line's going to meet, right? Because in, in years, 5, 10, 15 years, you're going to die from other, other uh, uh, medical problems, not because of the, oh, because of the uh, uh, blunt injuries. Um, so what have we learned so far? So this is the uh, 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 American Trauma Foundation. They have a, a retrospective registry, and they basically looked at uh, multiple centers, um, and then uh, the majority of these injuries uh, were grade three, uh, and then the uh, second was grade one, and then they had some grade four injuries. But basically, TIVA showed lower uh, mortality. It was statistically significant. And then also, uh, not just mortality, also for aortic-related uh, mortality, which we call ARM, uh, also they had a much lower mortality using TVAR. Um, and again, when they did the independent predictors, um, if you look at the, you know, the uh, p-values less than 0 0.001, so basically non-optive management was not, had a, you know, a high um, uh, uh, risk factor for mortality. Um, uh, and then obviously the um, SVS grade, the worst grade, the worst outcome. Uh, so these were statistically significant for all cause mortality as well as for aortic related mortality. Now what about uh, what we call non-ismic uh, aortic and arterial lacerations or injuries? <clears throat> I mean usually when it involves the ascending aorta and, <clears throat> and the arch, I know that usually we don't, we're not involved in these cases, but I think it's just a matter of time that we might when the technology is available. But basically these you need the uh, hypothermic circulatory arrest and, and, yeah, <clears throat> and then you have to evaluate the aortic valve and, uh, and then look at other injuries. So I'm just going to quickly, I added uh, some abdominal trauma because I think they only focused on the thoracic in the previous years. But we're all familiar with the zones, zones one, two, and three. Um, and this is basically a picture, uh, one in the middle, two on the sides involving the kidneys and the pelvic and the retroperitoneum is number three. <clears throat> and then uh, the mechanism of injury, usually 90% of penetrating injuries. Um, and then it could either manifest as early or late um, uh, th thrombosis or hemorrhage. A lot of times when I see some patients that might have some pseudos, I ask them, did you, like in the past, have any, any injuries, uh, you know, whether it's blunt or, or penetrating? And sure enough, a lot of times we're like, oh, yeah, you know, I was in a bad accident, you know, 20, 20 years ago, and now they have like this, uh, you know, pseudo aneurysm or something in the distal, distal aorta. Um, so at the end, same for blunt trauma, it's the same mechanism where you have a rapid deceleration, um, and then you know, again at fixed points, which basically are at the relos, right, and the and the internal iliac artery. That's where the aorta is usually fixed, uh, and then you could see some injuries uh, along those two fixed points, and then obviously, like we said, IVC is also one of the common injuries, especially for penetrating injuries. So you have to evaluate the IVC uh, in these cases too. <clears throat> Many of those actually die at the scene, and 14% uh, in the lose vitals and way to uh, en route to the ER. Again, you all you know the signs of shock, um, and then again, you know, uh, for those who do trauma, a lot of times, you know, if the patient is unstable, you just take them straight to the OR. Other things you can do, you know, you you can do um, uh, you can do I don't know if you still do DPLs and or just now we go straight to imaging and take them to the OR. But again, depending on the injuries, you can sometimes suspect. Suspect what kind of uh, vascular injuries they could, what you know, based on the bone injuries, what kind of vascular injuries they do. ED thoracotomy, I don't know. We, uh, uh, I'm, it's been a while. I don't know. I mean, we were called one time, not a long time ago, in the ED, and they had it was ED thoracotomy. It was just bloodbath. Obviously, the patient did not make it. And that's the problem with ED. But also the indication the patient lost pulse in the ED. So that's I guess they meet meet the criteria for uh, uh, for uh, uh, thoracotomy. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, there's a few more on abdominal trauma. Um, I think we just talked about the, uh, I think we talked about it. So some of the things that you have to remember when you're doing abdominal trauma, I, mean, I just left those in, you know, I mean, a lot of times you can do medial vis uh, 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 visceration, you can go both ways, you can mobilize everything to the, to the patient's uh, right or do vice versa, go to the patient's right, and that will give you a lot of control. Sometimes you might have to extend your incision a little bit further up if you want to get proximal control, get higher control on the chest until you fix uh, fix it. Uh, now the problem is that when you have spillage, uh, sometimes it's okay to use prosthetic because you know these are big vessels. You can't use veins and stuff. So a lot of times it's okay to use prosthetic for like if you have to replace a bad injury in the aorta. But sometimes you make sure you wash it out really well, control the spillage as much as you can, and maybe bring a piece of momentum and uh, put it over the the graft. All right, that's on time. Thank you.